What's up, everyone? Welcome to Found Flicks. On this ending explain, we're looking at the latest entry in the Evil Dead franchise, Evil Dead Rise, where we leave the cabin in the woods for the big city, following two estranged sisters, whose reunion is cut short by the rise of flesh-possessing demons, thrusting them into a primal battle for survival as they face the most nightmarish version of family imaginable. It's been an entire decade since Evil Dead has been on the big screen. Of course, we also have the TV show Ash vs. Evil Dead that continued the bumbling hero's adventures in between. Fortunately, as a huge fan of the franchise, I feel that Evil Dead Rise does the series justice by giving us a lot of what fans want, but also doing things through a quite different lens. As similar to Fede Alvarez with the 2013 Evil Dead, the longtime series producers, including Sam Raimi, Rob Tapert, and Bruce Campbell, personally selected the hole in the grounds Lee Cronin this time out. And Cronin definitely has his own particular take, but also features a family at the front and center, something we really haven't seen in the series. It, of course, also features the bloody Dead Eye Carnage that we've come to expect from Evil Dead, but it's presented in a fresh way. I also really like the specific ways that it expands the series and sort of begins to tie things together, involving the ubiquitous Book of the Dead. So let's dig into Evil Dead Rise, breaking down the story, its biggest references and callbacks to the series, as well as explaining the ending that leaves things wide open for the story to continue in a number of potential ways. Our opening shot is one familiar to any fan of the series, the classic Evil Force shot indicating that the evil is on its way. It's just a clever misdirect this time, seeing it's just Caleb's drone scaring Teresa half to death. She's not as amused by it as he is, complaining the blades could have taken her head off. He knows that they aren't powerful enough to cut her head completely off, but, you know, still could do some damage. It's clear that his mere presence is annoying her, shooing him to go check on his ill girlfriend, Jessica. He's not too sympathetic, chugging a beer and saying that she can sleep off whatever it is without any concern. She likes to go on her own, and we see the cabin certainly bears little resemblance to the appearance we are used to, with an odd triangle shape and bent trees framing it. Yet inside does look oddly familiar, in particular the old ticking clock on the wall. Teresa hears her pal grumbling on the other side of a curtain and finds her facing away. She warmly asks how she's doing while also admitting that she wants to leave. Since none of her friends showed up, she's been stuck with her latest a-hole boyfriend. Jess doesn't respond, only continuing to raspily breathe. She takes a seat and lays it out plain. If she doesn't wake up in the next 30 minutes, she's gonna drown her boyfriend's sorry ass. That is enough to elicit a chuckle at least. Teresa digs into Wuthering Heights and Jessica starts to weirdly spasm. Focused in on the prose, somehow Jessica starts mumbling along with each passage. Jess shoots up and gets more dramatic as she narrates from a portion of the book involving spirits. Teresa can't take it anymore, slamming the tome closed. A breeze blows through the curtains and the clock has stopped swinging, which as we know means that it's evil o'clock. Teresa pleads for her to stop and Jess screeches to let me in. She goes silent and lifelessly slumps off the side of the bed. Her eyes shoot open and she starts hacking up curious white goo. She violently hacks and chokes. Her eyes flutter and she stops moving. Although as it typically goes, you do gotta perish first before you can be resurrected by the evil. Teresa goes to check her breathing and her eyes rapidly dart. She grabs Teresa by the throat and plays with her braid. Who's the brainless mean puppet now? She growls and yanks off her entire head of hair, effectively scalping her. Ouch! Caleb is oblivious, taking a leak on the dock. He hears Teresa weakly gasp to get his attention. His gal follows after, tossing her scalp on the ground. Deadeye Jess grabs the drone and turns the blades on her face, launching her into the water. Dang, those are some pretty powerful propellers. The poor dunce, Caleb, dives in after her and quickly regrets his choice as his blood begins to pool in the water. He's dragged beneath the surface and his head is catapulted out, landing on the dock. Jess rises from the water and levitates into the air, looking quite terrifying. While the evil has spread into this group of friends in the woods, we leave the familiar surroundings and pick up back one day prior. Beth appears anxious in a dingy concert venue toilet. She does a pregnancy test amongst the filth and gets interrupted by a co-worker. He wants to make sure that she's okay and she shoes him away. Yet when she looks at the test results, she is definitely not looking okay. Searching for support, Beth pays a visit to her estranged sister in Los Angeles, arriving amongst an uncharacteristic heavy rainstorm, taking in the looming Bonday apartment building stretching high into the sky. Before the sisters are reunited, we are thrust into the hectic daily lives of Ellie and her brood of children. She's busy fixing a tattoo needle and is quite adept with a soldering iron. Before long, Bridget comes in to complain about a missing shirt that she needs for a protest, and no, she's not going on her own. Remember her friend is taking her? Golly, Mom. She suggests to check the hamper and tasks her to tell Danny to turn down his record. Cassie is a bit odd, cutting off the head of her doll for some purpose. Mama notices her missing scissors, and the girl guiltily tosses them under the couch. Some neighbor kids pop by to invite Bridget to a Freddy marathon, even including the bad ones, his younger bro, Scott 
Scott pipes in. Jake corrects his idiot sibling. There are no bad Freddy movies. So you want to come over? She's not exactly interested, slamming the door right in their faces. However, she does eye him after through the peephole. Hmm, maybe a little something there. He almost goes for another knock, but loses his nerve and shirks away defeated. Cassie, wearing a mop on her head, calls her boyfriends weirdos, and I'm like, um... They get into a brawl of sorts. And in the scuffle, the mop broom is broken, leaving it with a quite sharp edge. Bridget seeks solace in Danny's room, shouting for her to get out. Their sister tugs on the doors, and they work together to torture her, tossing her on the bed and enacting a full-on tickle assault. Mom has no idea what her kids are up to, preoccupied with rinsing out her new hair color. There's a ringing at the door that she is forced to answer. She checks the hall, and it appears empty, until her sister surprises her with a boo! Elle responding with a reactionary sucker punch to the nose. Huh, good to see you too, sis. Beth complains about the broken buzzer, but as Elle informs her, everything is busted around this dump, the whole building is actually going to be demolished in a month. She has yet to find a new place to stay, and Beth knows that that must be tough. Her and Jay have lived here forever. The family sit down to catch up, the kids hounding her with questions about her travels abroad. Beth notices the weird doll pole thing that Cassie has constructed, which she has dubbed Stephanie. It's all in case, as her brother has told her, a ghost comes to get her that lives in the building. He told her about the history of the place. Back when it was a bank, a teller stole and died in the vault. Ever since, he is said to be haunting the halls, scaring you to death, and taking all your money. But Cassie is prepared. If he comes after her, Stephanie is gonna get him first. Beth assures her that there's nothing to worry about, as ghosts aren't real. She only believes in things that she's seen personally. Well, uh, about to have a nice rude wake-up call in that regard. She gives Cassie a badass rocker bracelet, and Elle is annoyed, groaning about bringing her daughter into her groupie world. There's obvious friction in regards to her career, as Beth points out she's actually a guitar technician, not some floozy like she's accusing. Elle stays steadfast, giving her a shitty smirk back. If you say so. Sisters, what are you gonna do? Beth tells her to be nice and shows off another gift for the previously mentioned Jay, which creates an awkward moment of silence for the family. Obviously, Jay ain't around anymore. To get the full scoop, Elle sends the kids to fetch some pizzas so they can talk in private. We don't get many details as to what led to the separation, other than that he doesn't seem that interested in being a father. Beth feels guilty, as she didn't know about any of this. She would have been here in an instant if she did. Elle brings up that she actually did call her twice, first when he was leaving, and again when he moved out for good. Good. Huh? Shit. As Beth divulges, she sometimes gets caught up in her own little world, and this must be where all that distance and resentment has come from. Beth really wants to make up for her being absent, but Elle isn't interested in rehashing everything, at least allowing her to stay the night. Meanwhile, down in the garage, the kids are returning from their pizza run. Danny uses the remote, but the gate is sticky. Woo, hopefully that won't be a problem later at the most inconvenient time. Beth checks her phone and discovers a message from Elle, meaning she did in fact reach out, and Beth eh, kind of blew it. However, her her sister lets her off the hook and wants to know what's going on with her. Beth reveals a concerning destructive pattern of behavior, adding more layers to their troubled relationship. She screwed up again and needs her help again, she laments, before she can elaborate. There's a rumbling in the room. Down in the garage, the whole place starts shaking and cracks start exploding in the concrete. The kids flee to safety and before too long, the earthquake passes, but they are still shaken up. The real damage comes in the form of the pizzas that were dropped in the commotion, courtesy of Henrietta's Pizza, Evil Dead 2, reference there to the monstrous creature portrayed by Ted Ramey. And the parlor's tagline? Come get some! One of Ash's most memorable one-liners. Cassie is able to salvage a piece, and Dan has found something. A hole! A hole in the ground! Man, Cronin cannot get away from those, apparently. Dan just has to check it out, seeing the old bank vault has been unearthed. He uses his phone light to survey the vault, and I'm all, hmm, wonder why it was sealed up in the first place? And then he discovers another metal crate. Inside are a bunch of letters, along with a photo of three priests. Buried at the bottom are three musty looking records and a strange creak draws his attention. As anyone would wisely do in the situation, Danny stuffs all the goods into his backpack and then there's another strange noise. He spins back and a statue of Jesus comes lunging at him from the darkness. Whoa, watch out for that Christ. Speaking further to the Jesus warnings, Danny comes to a bunch of crucifixes and other medallions all in formation around a tomb. Debris falls from a hole and he reaches right in. He yoinks out a book wrapped in cloth. It strangely rustles underneath and he removes the fabric, unleashing a swarm of bugs. He takes in the book's odd appearance, and while it is certainly the well-known Book of the Dead, it doesn't look like any of the ones that we're used to. There's actually an interesting lore reason for this, as we find out later. Back in the apartment, they can't get a hold of the kids as the phone lines are down, but Beth is confident that they're fine. Elle pounds on a neighbor's door, and Gabe rushes outside to her aid. Gabe offers to take his car to help find the children, but first he's got to get his keys. Another gruff neighbor, Mr. Fonda, hasn't met Beth before, and when she says her name, he's all, oh yeah, 
yeah, the groupie. Ah, come on, now that's messed up, Ellie. Fonda is worried about his cat. The earthquake sent it hiding into the vents, and he attempts to lure it down with some treats to no avail. Mr. Fonda, obviously Bridget Fonda, Army Darkness. Luckily, the elevator arrives, and all the kids are on it to Ellie's relief. They check out their new treasures, and Danny is hopeful that they could be worth some cash. Mom really needs it. Bridget is annoyed, accusing him of stealing it. He sees things otherwise. It was just sitting down there for who knows how long. Although, as she points out, usually with weird stuff, it's down there for a reason. Uh, yeah. Danny attempts to pry open the book, but is foiled by its pointy interlocked teeth. While prying at it, he nicks his finger, and the blood drips right onto the cover, which it quickly absorbs. The unintentional offer causes the teeth to open up, tantalizing him to take a look. Danny opens it, perusing pages and pages of wanton, brutal violence, and horrific death displayed. She wants him to close the thing already, and after a few more pages, he relents that it is definitely disturbing. She demands that he go and put it back right now, but Mom won't let them leave the apartment after the quake. So, they agree that he will do so first thing in the morning, but it is a long way till then. Beth shows that she does have an instinct for motherhood when drawing Cassie a bath. The girl is terrified of the water after being stung by a jellyfish. Beth assures her that nothing is in there, reaching her whole arm in the bath. She feigns that something's got her and pulls out a rubber ducky with a smirk. Ha! Ah, gotcha! Beth is overtaken with pregnancy pains, and Cassie gives her a big old hug. She can relate to tummy trouble too. Now, normally in the series, someone is stupid enough to actually directly read from the Book of the Dead and bring forth the evil. At least in Danny's case, he unknowingly plays the troublesome recordings. So he's like, 2% mm, less stupid than usual. He digs out the dusty vinyl, seeing it's dated November 1923. After he does some manual spinning to get the speed just right, the crackling gives way to a low growling. Then a male's voice takes over. Father Littleton is addressing a congregation of his peers in LA. He's invited all of them to town to check out the unveiling of the book, which was just discovered by some overseas missionaries. One of the three volumes of the Naturum Demento. This seemingly offhand remark of three books got me standing at attention in the theater, because the only time in the series that there was ever any mention of more than one book was in a classic scene from Army of Darkness. The hapless Ash is tasked to pick the correct book from three. He bungles it as expected, and one bites him. I thought I was just overreaching, but Cronin confirmed that this connection is correct, even going so far as saying the one that chomped Ash is the very same book seen here. Thusly, the three books would be the Necronomicon Ex Mortis of the original trilogy, and the two Naturum Dementos, as seen in 2013 and right here. I was surprised to learn that this multiple book idea has been floated since all the way back to Evil Dead 2. The concept then was to have an opposite tome to the Ex Mortis, rather than evil, it was filled with good magic. This idea was ultimately dropped for the missing pages aspect from that movie, but it is still cool to see that concept resurrected here. Because even if it is incredibly subtle, it is still the most concrete connection between the entire series up to this point, at least when it comes to the movie specifically. Yet also appropriate in the recording, Littleton is desiring to translate the mysteries of the book. Others throwing back that that is a dangerous idea. Amongst the dissenters is none other than Bruce Campbell himself. It is called the Book of the Dead for a reason, he yells. The needle reaches the end, and Danny puts on part two. The father, we learn, was rejected by all the others, so he and two others worked in secret to translate the book's pages. They figured out, as we already know, that they contain ancient rituals and incantations designed to bring forth an evil supernatural force that exists between realms. Yep. Deadites, Kendarian demons, all that. Elsewhere, Elle is going to do some laundry, spurned on by Bridges' dirty tea. She stops briefly at an exit sign and hesitates before stepping onto the elevator. Yeah, that was your last chance to turn back and escape. Littleton continues his dictation and recites the specific words needed to bring forth the evil. Kanda, he chats, and the voice distorts to a low and evil tone. Danny feebly attempts to stop it, and the record continues the passage on its own. The real evil force appears out in the streets, and Danny sees the book's pages wildly fluttering. The force moves onto the garage, and right when the elevator door opens, slams into Ellie. The elevator kicks into action, flinging her to the ceiling. The book settles on a drawing of a woman with her ribs exposed. She comes to on the floor, unsure of what is going on here. She tries the buttons and shouts for help, but cannot be heard through the door. She jams at the doors with her keys, and a distorted voice grunts behind her. The force lifts up her hair and painfully yanks out her earring. The noises get more intense, and Elle falls to her knees, shouting for it to shut up! It does briefly, until a low growl returns. The force Max her around, and an elevator cable slinks down, wrapping around her neck. She struggles to balance herself on the handrail, and more cables emerge, stringing her up in a most uncomfortable looking position. A reference to perhaps the original film's most infamous moment where Cheryl is violated by a tree. Nothing to that degree here, though, thankfully. Ellie shrieks, and the overheads explode, sending sparks shooting everywhere and knocking out the computer and all the power completely. Dan slams the book closed, heaving, wondering what did he just do? Ah, uh, yeah, you really porked it, guy. Beth leads the siblings to their mother's room, but she's not there, wondering 
wondering what befell her. We float through the halls, the lights flickering unsteadily going towards the elevator. Yeah, it's not good, y'all. Once they get a shitload of candles going, Mommy returns home, completely obscured in darkness. She shambles inside and goes right to the stove. She cranks on the burner, and the others look on befuddled. Elle starts grabbing eggs, tossing them right into the pan, shell and all. Beth tries to see how she's doing, and Ellie speaks back in a daze. She goes on about a dream that she had with the family all together in a forest, and the birds were singing. Her speech begins to slur, and she continues that it was a perfect day. All she could think about was cutting them open and climbing inside their bodies so that they could be one happy family forever. Ellie chuckles maniacally, and it's pretty obvious that their mama is long gone, the evil has consumed her. She briefly is herself, acknowledging that the evil is within her, and tumbles to the floor. She starts fairly crawling at them on all fours, her limbs twisting horrifically. Her back cracks, and she retches a fountain of white goo all over the floor. Elle begs to not let it take her babies, and falls to the floor dead. Beth and Danny are still hopeful to get her help, dragging her to the elevator, but it's still on the fritz. No such luck on the stairs either. They're just gone, like completely destroyed. Well, looks like they are definitely stuck here for now. Beth can't believe how quickly all that happened. She was fine, then was talking cray, and now she's gone. Gabe helps get her in bed, and they try to close her eyes, only for them to creepily pop right back open. He thinks it's a good idea for them to pray together, even though Elle was not religious. After the holy moment, Gabe has a new potential means for them to get out of here, via the fire escape. Fonda deflates that they will have to get through another abandoned apartment, which is sealed up tight first. It's going to take some serious tools to get that door down. Cassie cries with her sister. All that she wants is for their daddy to return. Bridge fibs that he will be back as soon as the phones are fixed. Cassie ain't no dummy, asking how she knows, especially after she said mommy would be okay. That definitely wasn't the case, and Bridget laments that, well, she thought she would be. No hope in the face of the evil dad is the point here. Gabe hacks at the door, and Fonda is getting anxious being trapped. A fly buzzes through the air vent, and Beth cautiously takes a seat on the edge of the bed near her sister. She gets teary-eyed and is overwhelmed. She doesn't know what she will do without her. It was Elle who always had the answers, and Beth has absolutely no idea what to do with the kids on her own. She pours out her feelings for her lost sister. She always had time for everyone, no matter how busy she was, and she can't believe that she won't be able to speak to her ever again. Shockingly, Elle's voice crackles from the phone. The same message that Beth missed regarding her husband leaving. Further digging that emotional dagger in, she wasn't there when Elle needed her, despite her always being there for her. Elle then goes off script, screaming to her sister for help. She's burning alive! The screen cracks, and Beth drops the phone. She turns back, and Elle's eyes are wide open, leaving her flabbergasted. The fly buzzes right onto her open eyeball, and Elle blinks! She rises in bed, and Beth reaches a tentative hand towards her shoulder. The kids all bombard in, surprised to see Mommy is alive again. What? Not quite. They find her body is scorching hot and draw a cold bath to hopefully cool her off. Her pupils roll back in her head and Elle thrashes in the water aggressively. She then straight launches right up onto the ceiling. She crawls out on the ceiling screaming, causing the water to boil and the mirror and ceiling crack. Just as suddenly, she stops moving and flops right back into the tub. It's just a ruse and Ellie reaches out her hand, curling them over the side. She rises up, giving them all a toothy grin. Mommy? Danny asks innocently. She lets him down that Mommy is sleeping with the maggots now and she slinks on all fours after them. They back into the living room, and Ellie pops around the corner, purposefully stepping on broken glass, also noticing that she is wielding a sharp shard in her hand. Ellie eyes each of them hungrily, stumbling through the room. She fakes out Beth, and then goes at her with the shard. She holds up a hand to defense, and she impales it right through her palm. The same hand that is always getting majorly injured in the franchise. No chainsaw hand this time, unfortunately. In another staple, Elle's voice returns to its regular state, pressing Bridget with worry about what's happening. Mama tells her she knows exactly what's happening. She's finally free from her parasites, and flies through the air, tackling her. She takes her tattoo needle, bringing it right to her daughter's eyes, another Rami staple. Bridge turns away, and the needle grazes her cheek. Elle offers to kiss it better, extending a long black tongue. Danny whaps her with a chair, hurling her into a dark hall. Gabe and Fonda tiptoe into the apartment, and Elle asks from the darkness, who wants to rot next? For funsies, she does an eeny meeny miny mo amongst the family, extending a clawed hand. It's Gabe who is the winner, in a sense, well not really, sneaking in from the other side. Elle snarls and pushes him to the wall, chomping aggressively at his face. She bites down right on his eyeball, tearing it completely out. She starts gagging and spits it right into the other kid's gullet. Another moment straight out of Evil Dead 2, but it was Bobby Joe that got the rogue eyeball to the mouth after Ash popped it out. Bobby Joe! Bobby Joe!
Beth pushes the kids inside and slams the door, locking the chain. Elle starts rhythmically banging her head on the door, and Beth locks up even more. The banging stops, and Beth gets right up on the peephole, giving her a perfect view to the most cleverly blocked sequence in the entire franchise. Her sister goes bananas on everyone out there. The boy is heard grunting, and Elle tosses his body into view. Gabe appears at the door, gasping for help, and she tears his throat right out. Mr. Fonda lets off a flash from a shotgun, and he enters into the frame. The Deadite laughs, and he shrieks, getting yoinked away. With everyone dealt with, Elle returns to the door and puts her eye right up to the peephole. A desperate Beth is looking for ways out and looks out the window. It's far too high to jump, and there's only a disinterested homeless man as her audience, which is no help either. Bridget brings up to her brother that their mom looked like something right out of the book pages, and Danny takes a moment to answer before relenting. He should have never taken the book in the first place. Yeah, you think? He argues that it's not his fault, and Bridget disagrees, leading to a sibling throwdown. Beth breaks them up, urging to not turn on each other. She finally sees the tone for herself and wants to know what it is. She flips through the pages, looking sickened and frightened by the drawings. Ellie outside sings a lullaby, and Bridget goes into the kitchen, clicking on the stove. She removes the towel and sees that the wound has turned black, meaning that it's been infected by the evil, which will soon spread. Danny informs Beth about the record and the priest reading the dark prayer, getting emotional over what he brought forth. Bridge looks in closer at the wound and the darkness is already spreading, hearing a demonic voice calling for her. Uh, seems like the same thing should have happened with Beth's injury, but mm, guess not. The book starts to flip through wildly and black goo starts spilling from her nostrils. The book stops on a page featuring someone with tentacles busting out of their mouth. The goo starts really pouring out through her horror, spilling everywhere. Naive Cassie is lured to the door and sees her mom sitting Indian style facing away in the hall. She unnaturally rises to her feet, calling her a cutie pie. She asks what's wrong, and she's just feeling bad about her and dad. Well, no worries, as mommy tells her daddy is here, supposedly talking to him just out of sight. But you know, not really. Bridget coughs and attempts to gulp down a glass of water to no avail. She gags and vomits up a black pile of bugs. Appearing completely deranged, Elle growls to let us in. We can be a family again. Cassie points out that she is not looking so good. Elle assures her that it's nothing a hug and kiss from her can't fix. She keeps encouraging her to be a good girl and open up, which she eventually does. Instantly, Elle goes right for her throat, and the others run in and pull her from her dead-eyed mommy's grip. Beth gets the door sealed back up, and Cassie apologizes. She thought her mom was better. Elle screeches to her sis to open the door like she does her legs, and Beth has had enough, shouting back, I'm not a groupie, you psycho bitch! Things go concerningly quiet, and Beth sends the kids to hole up in the room for now. Danny is shaken up, and Cassie tells him it's fine. Staphne will protect us. Danny wraps his arm around her, and something is heard clattering in the kitchen. The place is in shambles when Beth enters, discovering Bridget crouched strangely on the counter. Beth nervously gets closer, asking what she's looking at. There's some glass splintering heard, and we see Bridge is munching down on a wine glass, now fully possessed. Bridge tells her quite seriously that she has to kill the creepy crawlies that are in her tummy, and she begins laughing in a sinister tone. I don't like things in my tummy. Do you, Auntie Beth? She inquires, and goes back to chowing down. She spits some blood at Beth, sending her tumbling to the floor. Bridge climbs down, and Beth kicks her back. She flings a cheese grater at her, which Bridge impressively catches. She unleashes it upon her aunt's leg in a very uncomfortable moment. Ouch! Beth goes at her with a series of pots, and one stops her for the moment. It's really not more than mere seconds before she snaps back up and chases her brother through the apartment. He attempts to stop her with the door, but she barges right in, going for Cassie. The girl holds up Staphne in defense, and it goes right through her sis's head. And dang, that is a pretty sharp pull there. Bridge gargles and yanks it right out, gore dribbling from her lips, and she falls limp once more. It looks like she's officially dead as a pool of blood spreads from her body. Cassie is beside herself after witnessing all the horrors unfolding here, asking Beth if this is a nightmare. She concurs that it certainly is like one, and the girl is worried that they are going to turn into deadites too. Beth promises that she will not let that happen, and Cassie offers that she will make a good mama someday. The sentiment really gets to Beth. Oh yeah? Yeah, she replies. You know how to lie to kids. Pretty important part of being a parent though. They decide to restrain Bridget, covering her in a blanket and tying her up just in case. Beth wants to hear the vinyl for herself, and Danny thinks it's too dangerous, but there could be more words on the recording to undo the ritual. Problem is, there's still no power, but apparently just like her sis, Beth is handy with a soldering iron and gets a battery wired up to somehow power his monstrous amount of equipment. Yeah, that might last about two seconds in real life. Even that, it's a lot of stuff to power. She gives him a knife in case things go haywire and closes herself in a room alone to hear the recording. She puts on the needle and the father's voice crackles to life. At this point, he's already read the words and has come to regret his choice, saying that this recording will act as his final warning. If the book cannot be destroyed, then you gotta put it in a secret vault. He reveals the words brought forth a demonic entity which possessed his colleague, rotting him from the inside out. They try to use prayer 
Ferrer to drive it out, but the demon only mocked them and took his other bro under its control too. More priests later came to their aid, only leading to a further spread of the possession. In the hall, Elle hears Fonda's cat meowing from the vents, which gives her an idea. At first I was like, oh shit, is she gonna make the cat into a dead eye? Unfortunately not. Would have really brought us into Demons 2 territory then. On the record, the father continues to detail his plight to get rid of the evil. He killed his friend, but that didn't work, so he set the woodshed ablaze. That didn't do it either, as they all danced in the flames mockingly. He buried them in consecrated earth too, but uh-uh, they came back, as we saw Ash deal with in the first films. The only surefire way is total bodily dismemberment. Meanwhile, Bridget starts convulsing back to life, and we hear Mommy clattering around in the vents overhead. Danny goes to the door, and his sister appears with a blanket still over her. She goes right for Cassie, and he shoves her away, taking on the ghoulish figure. Unknowingly, he has stabbed her right in the gut. She looks up and flies at him, resembling a specter, knocking him right into the counter. She removes the blade and jams it deep into his arm. Beth is still listening to the record, not noticing her sister crawling on the ceiling behind her. Bridge vomits blood all over Danny, like a lot of blood, and he pulls off the blanket. She yanks out the blade, reiterating that he should have put the book back and stabs him once more. He utilizes hairspray with the gas range to make a makeshift flamethrower, setting Bridget ablaze. The priest continues crying that he can still hear his pals calling for him and knows that it's only a matter of time until they take him too. At this point, he feels nothing can stop the force. All you can really do is run. Elle pops up in the window's reflection, her sister finally noticing her there. She puts her claw on the record and opens up her mouth, making a speaker. She broadcasts further. The horror will not stop until innocence is destroyed. Until evil be thy name. Beth goes at her with a screwdriver and Elle looks more annoyed than anything, tossing her into the living room. Danny is not doing so well in his fight, heaving to Cassie that he's sorry for everything. Ellie gets Beth from behind, growling that she's going to swallow her soul. Elle spins her over and sniffs her body, stopping on the belly, hearing a heartbeat. Thanks, sis, and your super deadite sniffing power. Beth pleads to her sister, and the deadite retorts that Ellie waits in hell for her and her unborn bastard baby. She digs her hand into Beth's tummy, and Cass sends her the scissors. Beth jams him right into her face, and she is once more briefly out of commission. Like, ow, oh, that really hurt. Give me a sec here. Jeez, guys, because we know that won't last too long. She texts on Cass, who is more interested in her being a mommy. Yes, Beth tells her, and she vows that she is going to get them out of here. She unlocks the door, stepping out into the corpse-filled hall. She takes a hammer to the fire escape door, hitting it repeatedly to no effect. She then sees Fonda's gun and wrestles it from his grasp. Elle spurns to life and removes the scissors with a fleshy squelch. Beth fires at the door, but then her sis shows up, floating at her and shouting for her precious Bethy Boo! And Elle turns back to normal, blaming her for trying to take the kids away. They know that it's not her mom anymore, and Elle cries that she doesn't get what it's like to bring a child into this world. Beth steadies her aim, and Fonda reanimates, grabbing her arm, and she biffs her headshot, getting her arm instead. Fonda is annoyed for stealing his gun, and she turns the butt on him, bashing his face up good. The kid that I shuffle on the scene and mourn their mama, only to quickly start cackling insanely, also including Ellie. The whole gang lets them down that everyone here dies by dawn. Dead by dawn, the others chime in. I mean, do I need to point out that reference? They keep chanting the phrase, as the girls bolt to the janky elevator. The doors keep opening and closing until Cassie removes the key ring and they finally close. Beth tries a button and they all light up, then one by one start getting filled up with blood. The motor clunks to life and blood begins seeping in from the floors. The kids tear at their mom's insides greedily and the book turns to an image of a figure with multiple limbs known as the Marauder. The blood evader is really filling up now and Beth gets a ceiling tile loose. A gaggle of dead eyed arms claw at them and the entire interior fills with blood. We hear the cable snapping, and the elevator plummets to the bottom floor, unleashing an overlook hotel-sized deluge of blood. Beth rattles Cassie awake, wondering if she's dead. Nah, no such luck, kid. They hustle to the garage and to the family wagon. Cassie keeps staring back nervously to the doors, just waiting for something to come. The car roars to life, and Beth backs up towards the gate. Just need that beeper to work. Wouldn't you know it, it's spotty once more. After several frantic button smashes, the gate groans to life. Beth kicks the car into gear, but is foiled by a smoking hole in the ground. Cassie looks back, and the doors are swinging, meaning the marauder is on the scene. It's coming, she warns. Beth peers ahead, seeing a horrific amalgamation of bodies twisted together in the fog. They flee the car and hide on the other side, hearing the creature groaning and shuffling around. It looks like the coast is clear, and they sneak towards the open gate. The marauder appears with a shriek, sending them back to hide. The massive arms wave towards them, and they retreat to a column for cover. But they are about to be trapped again, seeing the gate starting to close up. The pair rush towards it as it lowers, and Beth rolls under it just in the nick of time, indie style. Yet Cassie is left behind and gets snatched away. Beth screams and tears at the gate, kicking at another weak spot. The thing takes Cassie to the back of Fauna's truck. The arms work in tandem to bring an Oldsmobile Delta colorway chainsaw to life. All I want is your head, baby girl, Ellie 
Bandicoos, bringing the whirring blade closer. Beth fires, distracting the creature, letting Cassie loose. Come get some! Beth scowls, really embodying the spirit of the one and only Ashley J. Williams. The creature tosses this off, and Beth backs away, tumbling over the machine. The Marauder busts out, crawling towards her, all three faces of the dead-eyed family staring blankly. They drag her towards the wood chipper, and Bridge turns a crank to activate the meat grinder of doom. Cassie runs over to the lever and gets it shut off just before Beth is mince meated. Beth gets to the chainsaw and the creature shambles out while she gets the saw going again. And she shouts for Cassie to crank the chipper back on. She jams the blade right into the meat of the marauder, shoving them back into the machinery. Well, that certainly fits the bill for a total bodily dismemberment, the family shrieks as they are sucked into the blades, leaving only a relentless Ellie. She grabs at the walls, asking her to please help me, Betty Boo. Only my sister gets to call me that, Beth growls, and stabs the saw into her head, sending the rest of her into the chipper. Her head ends up being all that remains, and it still keeps poking at Beth. She scoffs that she really does look like their mom and is going to fail just as she did. You stinking groupie cunt! And Beth punts her head right into the chipper. Well, that takes care of that. She goes to a weeping Cassie's side, giving her a big hug as they mourn the family and all the evil shenanigans they've been through this night. She takes Cassie's hand and wisely stops to retrieve the chainsaw before they leave the building for good. As we know, however, it is not so easy to keep a Kandarian evil force down, tying back to our cabin dwellers from the opening. I did wonder what was going on. Was it just on the floor and the whole building that all this crazy crap was happening? And it strangely appears that the madness was exclusive to the family's floor, as in the rest of the building had no idea about any of that happening. Although we do hear approaching sirens. Jessica had no idea, complaining about the storm keeping her awake. She does her best to try to convince her pal to come along for the weekend, attempting to lure her in with the promise of loving Caleb's guy friends, which we know now was a total lie. Jess is adamant that she's already on her way to pick her up. There's no turning her down now. Preoccupied, she walks through the blood and gore-filled garage, noticing nothing out of the ordinary. So when checking the rear view, she gets quite the shot. She freaks and goes for her phone. There's a loud clanging, and then another from another side. The lights begin blinking, and the evil force comes flying at her from both directions, meaning that she is now possessed. This leads on to her and the others heading out to the cabin in the opening, now knowing that the evil is still out there within Jessica. Plus, the Book of the Dead was just left at the apartment. There's a lot left in the air to potentially explore in a sequel. Hopefully, it won't be another decade before we get a follow-up, and I'd really like to see them start to really connect the series a bit more as a whole. We really haven't had a follow-up in the newer movies, and it would be cool to see Beth team up with Mia to find a way to stop the evil once more. You know, instead of retreading the same basic setup we're used to, someone reads the book and all that. I feel like it's time to really evolve the series and take it into a new direction. Even heck, have Jessica out there creating her own army of evil or something. Or if they want to kind of continue it but do things very differently, then follow the priest from the 20s, that'd be cool too. Different, uh, you know, time and whatever. With that, we reach the conclusion of this ending explained for Evil Dead Rise. Don't forget, before we go, you can send me a request for any movies or TV shows you'd like to see me explain by sending them my way on any of my social media accounts at Foundflix. What did you think of Evil Dead Rise and its ending? What would you want to see in a follow-up? Which is your favorite of the series? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Foundflix. See you next time.